Alors, nous allons conclure la matinée avec Jeffrey Collins, qui est professeur au Bard Graduate Center à New York. Jeffrey est l'auteur d'un livre très important sur le mécénat de Piscis à Rome à la fin du XVIIIe siècle et aussi de plusieurs articles sur l'histoire du Museo Pio Clementino. Il travaille sur les liens entre l'archéologie et l'antiquaria, la muséologie et l'art néoclassique dans l'Italie du XVIIIe siècle, mais aussi il s'intéresse à la diffusion et à la présentation didactique des plâtres. Encore, il s'est occupé du rôle du costume dans les peintures théâtrales du peintre hollandais Cornelis Trost, et puis encore euh, sur la signification des thèmes de Ovidien dans les peintures de Giulio Carpioni, et il a élargi davantage ses horizons en s'intéressant à l'art colonial de l'Amérique latine. Il continue néanmoins à travailler sur le Grand Tour et sur le, musée, euh, com euh, le monument commémoratif. Voilà euh, les raisons pour lesquelles aujourd'hui Jeffrey est ici pour nous parler d'un autre aspect euh, très peu étudié, au fond, sauf pour dire un peu les mêmes choses, c'est-à-dire l'intérêt pour la peinture ou les réactions autour de la peinture. Okay. Okay, merci Daniela, Cécile, Alain, pour euh, l'accueil chaleureux et surtout pour l'invitation de contribuer à, à ce colloque, que je trouve très intéressant et instructif. Euh, je vous prie tous de m'excuser pour parler en anglais, mais vous pouvez bien sûr euh, répondre dans la langue que vous préférez, euh, sauf le portugais. Non, c'est pas moi. C'est moi qui, qui dois faire. Cécile, vous êtes plus habile. C'est un autre This must be Cécile. C'est pas celui-là, c'est ça C'est un autre one. Voilà. OK. It may seem strange, in a colloquium on Winkelmann and the work of art, to focus on painting. As book designers tell us, the Prussian scholar is typically associated with sculpture, from Alex Potts's 1994 Flesh and the Ideal, to last year's anniversary exhibition in Weimar. The Leokoan adorns the Geschichte's recent French translation, just as sculpture is the realm of Daniela's own exploration of that text's link with contemporary production. And this is entirely fitting if we consider Winkelmann's perfect work of art as calm, isolated, and white as Greek marble. Beauty, he writes, should be like the purest water drawn from the source of a spring, the less taste it has, the healthier it seems to be because it is clear of all foreign particles. Painting, with its distracting color, perspective, and brushwork, seems far from this ideal. To the extent Winkelmann is linked to specific paintings, it's often Mengs's famous forgery as reconstructed by Steffi Röttgen, an understandable mistake if we consider the two men's shared vision of Greek art. We perhaps see that vision best in Mengs's contemporary Parnassus, whose statue-like, nearly actionless figures reflect both Villa Albani's Alantica atmosphere and the ideals of a painter who, as his friend put it, has, quote, arisen like a phoenix out of the ashes of the first Raphael to instruct the world about beauty in art. Yet, if one reads Winkelmann with closer attention to artistic materials and genres, as this colloquium encourages us, we find a man deeply engaged with the history and direction of what was, after all, the dominant medium of his day. Painting, in fact, gets top billing in his 1755 thoughts on the imitation of Greek works in painting and sculpture, in which the first artworks mentioned are paintings by Correggio, followed by the Laocoon, and then again Zeuxis's painting of Helen. As Professor Borbein showed us yesterday, the very title page depicts Timanthes painting the sacrifice of Iphigenia on a canvas or a panel with brushes and paint pots in the foreground. Such an interest is not surprising when we recall Winkelmann's early artistic ambitions. Describing his childhood to Johann Georg Villa in 1756, he recalled that, quote, nature had wanted to make me a painter, but my parents' incomprehension turned me firmly from that path. In the meantime, everything I read became, so to say, painting. 
Upon moving to Dresden in 1754, he took drawing lessons from the painter Adam Friedrich Oeser, who contributed that vignette and directed his house guest studies. And I show you Oeser's uh, 1766 portrait of his children that suggests his interest in uh, artistic pedagogy. In the morning, as Winkelmann informed a friend, I study and draw until 11 o'clock, whereupon I go to the Royal Library or the gallery. A week later, he reiterated, every day I draw for at least two hours. Although it did not make Winkelmann a painter, this training gave him confidence to judge anatomy, expression, drapery, and coloring, not to mention authenticity, all qualities essential to his later scholarly work. Applying those insights to ancient painting was another matter. If sculpture could be approached through drawings, paintings, and casts, as well as Dresden's prized Herculaneum women, no such equivalence existed for ancient painting. For generations, the evidence was purely literary, either direct from ancient authors like Pliny or via modern compilers, such as the Earl of Arundel's librarian, Franciscus Unius, whose 1637 De Pictura Veterum, also translated into English, marshaled ancient sources on both painting and poetry. And I think Van Dyck's portrait of uh, Unius holding a book suggests that project's literary nature. By the late 17th century, discoveries of Roman era wall paintings in and around the Eternal City prompted publications like this 1680 book on the tomb of the Nazoni, popular, popularly associated with Ovid, containing descriptions by Giovanni Pietro Bellori and plates by Pietro Santi Bartoli, including both figural scenes that were detached and collected and the larger decorative schemes that were quickly ruined by exposure to light, air, and soot. And I think we can understand how that happened from this alarming view of tourists in the, in the Domus Aurea around 1800. Drawing on both evidentiary streams, the Scottish theologian George Turnbull's 1740 treatise on ancient painting offered, quote, observations on the rise, progress, and decline of that art among the Greeks, a subject obviously dear to Winkelmann's heart. Yet he dismissed the book scathingly in the Gedanken, writing that James Min's 50 engravings after drawings by Camillo Paderni, quote, alone give some value to the magnificent and abused paper of this work. And uh, here we see from last night's wonderful visit, um, Winkelmann's own anthology of writings on ancient painting, including the book with extracts from Turnbull's treatise. How then was a Saxon Hellenist to penetrate not just the minutia, but the essence of ancient painting? How could one make sense of this lost art? As Winkelmann insisted, the path was always indirect, even in Rome. We must constantly infer, he wrote in 1764, what constituted the most beautiful works of art from what are to all appearances no more than mediocre productions and consider ourselves fortunate as after suffering a shipwreck to collect individual planks. Today, I'll survey that salvage process at three stages of Winkelmann's career, asking how his continued engagement with both ancient and modern painting fit with this larger enterprise. We start in the early 1750s, was when Winkelmann was still working in Nutnitz, but traveling to Dresden to study its picture collection. And I, I can't resist showing you Theobald uh, von Ur's 1874 vision of the young librarian holding forth on a bust that he's just lowered from the bookshelves. Um, here, by contrast, is Bellotto's view of the electoral stables turned gallery, painted just a few years before Winkelmann was visiting. Winkelmann's unfinished and unpublished description of this gallery's most excellent paintings, begun in 1752, seems to have been intended as a guide for the young Count von Bunau. Yet one senses that the 35-year-old Winkelmann was also talking to himself, testing his ideas and mining the collection for insights into both ancient and modern art. And here I show you the only surviving view of the interior of that, uh, of that collection, showing the inner painting gallery as it existed in 1830. Already the sharp-tongued critic, he scolds Jonathan Richardson for misleading visual comparisons, Veronese for ahistorical costumes and overly long fingers, a Nibelet for confused chronology, and nearly every modern painter for de uh, depicting the Magi in a stable. The Greek word, he notes, just means dwelling. But Winkelmann also showcases his visual acuity, sifting autograph from studio works while stressing formal evolution. Quote, one can perceive with pleasure and amazement, he writes, the leap he, Correggio, made from his early uh, to his most mature style. Titian altered his style more than once, 
while Guido Reni manifested discrete early, middle, and late manners, all represented in the gallery. This obviously heralds uh, concerns for periodization uh, that would animate the Geschichte. Connoisseurship, of course, was also an exercise in taste, and here the results are not always what one would, would expect. If Finkelmann's censure of Veronese's drawing is conventional, it's more surprising to hear him chastise the Karachi for lacking, quote, the beauties of nature and light and shade, a lesson he locates surprisingly in antiquity. There is something missing in their works, he writes, that can be found in the works of Correggio, Guido, Rubens, Van Dyck, Rembrandt, and almost all the good Dutch painters. What is more, he adds, the Karachi had a dark way of painting, unlike, unlike the strength and audacity of Caravaggio, whose black shadows had the ability to, quote, make everything really tangible. And here Winkelmann is referring to this uh, picture of a guardroom, which is now given to Nicolas Tournier. Inexperienced minds, he clarifies, judge works of this kind in almost the same way as the Chinese judge of our paintings in general. They believe that violence is being done to nature, which is seldom unfriendly and gloomy, but beautiful and bright. And here I show you the the, the Caravaggio, whose style Winkelmann observed most closely, and it's, of course, actually by Valentin de Boulogne. In Rubens's paintings, Winkelmann continues, the opposite is the case. Light spreads everywhere. But these different styles are based on the different percept disposition of the senses and human feelings. So already among the painters of the ancient Greeks and Romans, there were some who adapted a dark and others a bright style. The example of the ancients then, as generalized from texts, justifies a variety of painterly manners, including the unclassical. This correlative instinct is confirmed by Winkelmann's enthusiasm for Francesco Trevisani, whose massacre of the innocents he found, quote, one of the greatest in the gallery. What the ancients said of Menander, he wrote, can rightly be said of Trevisani, that he drew his creativity from the sea out of which the goddess of love was born. All his works are full of spirit and charm. And since um, Trevisani's picture was destroyed in 1945, I show you the recently acquired oil sketch that I think conjures something of its dense composition and coloristic effects. For Winkelmann in 1752, the massacres by Trevisani and the slightly older Venetian Andrea Celesti were, quote, true heroic poems, as perfect in their style as the poem Strage degli Innocenti by the Cavaliere Marino, another modern we don't expect to hear praised by Winkelmann. Like Marino, Trevisani achieved fine order without confusion, capturing the struggle between, quote, rage and compassion, love and despair in the faces of the murderers and mothers in ways similar to what he would detect in the Naibids, the Laocoon, and the Vatican Apollo. Trevisani's success, he wrote, rests upon his, quote, style of painting flatly in the modo vago introduced by Guido Reni and Carlo Maratta, quote, by which the contours lose themselves in faint and gentle shadows. This surprising taste for the new informs Winkelmann's praise of Trevisani's flight into Egypt, whose, quote, magnificent landscape demonstrates modern art's improvement. Here, Winkelmann immediately clarifies that, quote, I am not referring to the ancient Greeks and Romans, a telling aside suggesting either a lack of sufficient evidence in this area or, what I think more likely, an area of modern superiority. Winkelmann attributes this progress to the studies of Claude Lorraine, to advances in livestock breeding, and especially the mild Netherlandish climate, which fosters the abundant and beautiful foliage captured by Dutch painters again, a herald of climate's role in his later account of Greek art. In sum, although Winkelmann's early views on modern pictures might seem far from his ideas about art of antiquity, they reveal his instinct to bring them into a historical and critical dialogue. If we return to the Gedanken of early 1755, we see Winkelmann maintaining this comparative impulse while refining his aesthetic principles. Yet we'd be wrong, as Daniela stresses, to read these thoughts as a coherent manifesto or as his last word on the topic. For Elisabeth Descruteaux, they are rather, quote, une série discontinue de contradictions fortes et d'interrogations profondes, résultant souvent d'une combination étrange entre des argumentaires opposés et tronqués d'une partie de leur substance. Even Goethe found the Gedanken, quote, so wayward and eccentric that it would be futile to try to make any sense of them without knowing which connoisseurs and critics were then gathered in Saxony. <laughs> 
That is how Catherine Harlow has recently approached them, as, quote, a show of learned eloquence that was also in career terms something between an insurance policy and a calling card. Following Descultot, she emphasizes Winkelmann's immersion in recent art theory, particularly the Carrel des Anciens et des Modernes, and related controversies, debates that bear directly on his ideas about ancient and modern painting. As expected, Winkelmann buttresses his plea for imitation of the ancients by pairing ancient and modern masters. It is thus with the same enlightened eyes through which the Theban painter Nicomachus per uh, perceived the genius of Zeuxis that Michelangelo, Raphael, and Poussin, now Winkelmann's heroic triumvirate, quote, considered the performances of the ancients. Rubens is contrasted with Euphranor and Parasios in his failure to master contour, whereas Raphael's idealized Galatea exemplifies how Greek artists formed certain ideas of beauty raised above the reach of mortality. Still anchored in literature, this trope of continuity was not, in fact, so distant from George Turnbull, who likewise compared, quote, the characters, talents, and accomplishments of the chief masters in Greece about the time of Apelles with those of the more distinguished painters about that of Raphael. As Turnbull explained, quote, there is indeed a likeness between these two ages of the art, which is very surprising, and it is by itself for that reason a phenomenon well worth the philosopher's attention. And here I show you again a page of Winkelmann's extracts from Turnbull. Even if Winkelmann rejected Turnbull's view that every modern accomplishment in, quote, innovation, I mean, excuse me, invention, design, disposition, proportion, coloring, clair-obscure, rounding relief, beauty, sweetness, strength, boldness, majesty, grace, or any other excellence can, quote, also be found in the character of some ancient painter in some eminent degree. Both clearly viewed Raphael as the modern Apelles, sharing, and here I quote Turnbull, the same temper, turn, and disposition of mind. Indeed, Winkelmann surely agreed with his Scottish nemesis that, quote, the same idea of the art and the same method of study formed the painters in every age. Winkelmann pursues his version of the quarrel in the Gedanken's penultimate section, even while stressing the limitations of current knowledge. Had Greek painting survived, he asserts, we would praise it as much as Greek sculpture. As things stand, Greek painters are granted excellence in contour and expression, but not in perspective, composition, or coloring. Even this view, he explains, is based on extrapolation from bas-reliefs and the 30 or so surviving pictures unearthed in Rome and Naples, Ancient, yes, but certainly not Greek, and not particularly good. These include the famous Aldobrandini wedding, shown here uh, together with Turnbull's plate, and the presumed uh, Marcius Coriolanus, as drawn by Anibale. And here I show you Bartoli's uh, engraving of Anibale's drawing around uh, 1685, which is how Winkelmann would have seen it. And then for comparison, the surviving panel in the Domus Aurea. Winkelmann was just as dismissive of the life-size figures, quote, pulled off with the walls of the Herculaneum Theater, it's a mistake, um, that is, the Theseus and the Minotaur, Flora with Hercules and Faunus, the pretended judgment of the Decamir Appius, and here I show you the first as illustrated by Bellicard and Cochin in 1753, which is how Winkelmann would have seen it in Dresden, contrasted with the more detailed rendition in the Antiquità di Ercolano Esposti of 1757, and the Gedanken, of course, is exactly in between those dates. All these pictures, he explained, based on the testimony of an artist who saw them, presumably Cochin, are of a contour as mean as faulty, and the heads want not only expression, but those in the Claudius even character. Yet despite these poor witnesses, Winkelmann agrees that modern painters excel the ancients in perspective and coloring, not to mention the, quote, laws of composition and ordonnance, as well as landscapes, cattle pieces, and the use of oil paint views hard to square with the straight apology for antiquity, but reinforced, as Descultot suggests, by Winkelmann's process of mining his archive of extracts culled from both sides of the quarrel. For the Winkelmann of 1755, then, Greek painting, even more than Greek sculpture, remains a vague but essential reference point in an aesthetic theory informed by writers from Bellori to Perrault to Depille to Richardson. This becomes clear in the Gedanken's final section, which calls for reforming modern painting, particularly mural and ceiling decoration, by embracing allegory. Winkelmann's gold standard was Rubens' Medici cycle at the Luxembourg Palace, as Claudia showed us yesterday, followed, perhaps surprisingly, by Daniel Grand's Apotheosis of Carl VI and Vienna's Imperial Library, of which he provides a full exegesis in the Erleuterung, a sure sign that we're in the realm of princely panegyric. <clears throat> 
As Claudia stressed, Winkelmann saw allegory as the way to go, quote, beyond the senses and beyond the shop-worn stories of martyrs and fables, saints and metamorphoses that stifled modern artists, including Enible Caracci. By transcending mere anecdote, allegory accessed the elevated pitch the Greeks sought in both painting and poetry, as Franciscus Unius had argued. For Winkelmann the idealist, a stress on moralizing allegory reclaimed the grandeur he'd projected onto antiquity, reviving the Greek spirit, if not the physical form. But for Winkelmann, the rising scholar, a stress on allegory was also a shrewd way to bypass the distressingly scanty visual evidence of ancient painting, which was not his expertise, and reclaim the familiar territory of ancient texts of which he was a master. And I'll just show you two plates uh, of the plates from Ripa that he particularly critiqued and proposed to improve and simplify with his immense classical learning. More than any aspect of his treatise, his concluding call to arms was both polemical and self-promoting, retooling debates about interior decoration into urgent issues for potential priest, uh, princely patrons. To my knowledge, it's not been properly uh, appreciated that Winkelmann's denunciation of the illogical, undecorous, and anti-classical caricatura carvings and favorite shells that fill, quote, our trifling house paintings are direct echoes of the denunciation of the Rococo or Goût Moderne by French commentators beginning with Voltaire, who's the 1733 uh, Temple du Goût, Blondel, Soufflot, Abbé Leblanc, and particularly Charles Cochin, the same who had condemned the Herculaneum paintings. And here I show you uh, a plate by uh, Jacques de la Joux that typifies, I think, the fantasy inherent in this stylistic current. Winkelmann even copied Cochin's ruse of ginning up readership by publishing opposing articles in the Mercure de France in December 1754 and February 1755, exactly as the Gedanken was taking shape. In his own manufactured exchange, Winkelmann, like, like Cochin, first takes the side of the Parisian decorators, arguing that shell ornament is no more illogical or unnatural than the Greek sculptor Callimachus's invention of the Corinthian capital as recounted by Vitruvius. He then reverses himself, noting that, quote, even if it would go against all reason for a painter to transport himself in his imagination to ancient Greece, the necessity for public buildings to endure for the ages requires decorators to choose motifs sanctioned by tradition or, quote, the rules and taste of antiquity. Even if this argument embraces architecture and the applied arts, it remains centered on decorative painting, laying out the historical, aesthetic, and moral criteria on which it should be judged. In concluding now with the Geschichte of 1764, I'm aware that I'm shortchanging Winkelmann's most concerted consideration of, a, of ancient painting after his first direct exposure to it. But as Daniela provides such helpful notes to Tassel's translation, I'll merely sketch a few continuities and change in Winkelmann's mature approach to the topic. First, despite his goal of rooting the history of art, not of artists, in first-hand examination, Winkelmann remains tied to textual sources when it came to ancient painting. As a historian, his method was to find fixed points, such as Pliny's note that painting did not exist during the Trojan War, on which to outline a chronology, and then use his connoisseurs and practitioners' insight to connect the dots. In terms of origins, as Alain quoted yesterday, Winkelmann reasons that art began with sculpture, not painting, since the former is simpler to imagine and execute, requiring the mere conception of the thing, rather than a more complex translation into two dimensions. Their development was similar, however, and just as Daedalus's wood carvings featured straight lines and a flat manner of delineation, the first paintings are to be envisioned as monograms, as Epicurus called the gods, that is, as single line outlines of human shadow. As art matured, Winkelmann argues that sculpture advanced before painting and, like an elder sister, guided the younger. Thus, only after sculptors added genitals to block-like herms did Eumaros of Athens, who lived before Romulus, distinguish sexes in painting by the form of their youthful faces. In a similar way, Winkelmann deployed his connoisseurial training to reconstruct stylistic developments and chronicle regional schools. Light and shadow, he writes, were introduced by Apollodorus and his pupil Zeuxis around the 90th Olympiad, pre whereas previously figures were represented in paintings like statues placed next to one another. Aside from the action in which they are engaged with one another, they appear as individual figures, not constituting a totality in a manner similar to the paintings on so-called Etruscan vessels. According to Pliny, Euphranor, who was a 
a contemporary of Praxiteles, and I continue to quote Winkelmann, and thus lived later than Zeuxis, introduced symmetry into painting. At other, at other times, it was painting that, in that uh, innovated, as when Parasios introduced the grace that, quote, some time later appeared as well in marble and in bronze, above all in the work of Praxiteles. Winkelmann's new emphasis on chronology, however, did not replace analogies between ancient and modern. Like Turnbull, he continues to liken Greek's golden, uh, Greek art's golden age from Pericles to the death of Alexander uh, to the reigns of, of Julius II and Leo X with Raphael and Michelangelo in the roles of Apelles and Lysippus. Likewise, the decadence that followed until the restoration of Greek freedom in the 144th, uh, 45th Olympiad, quote, must have been like the period from Raphael and Michelangelo up to the Karachi, whom, following Bellori and Malvasia, Winkelmann credits with reopening eyes after a period of blindness. And even if paintings preceding more primitive periods cannot be exactly compared, they shared for Winkelmann the key quality of improvability because they were both simple, pure, and uncorrupted. In other passages, Winkelmann thinks horizontally, seeing painting as a manifestation of broader cultural and social trends. Thus, Greek painting, like the other arts, progressed because it was taught in the schools, judged publicly and fairly, and because artists worked for eternity, not for money. And I, obviously, a degree of wishful thinking uh, remains uh, from the Gedanken. As for why painting lagged sculpture, Winkelmann notes that whereas the latter was nurtured by religious practices, Paintings were rarely destined as cult objects. The contrast was thus similar to that between poetry and oratory, just as Cicero noted that there were more good poets than good orators. Finkelmann balanced this with evidence that painters decorated important public buildings and shared the respect accorded all Greek artists from weavers, leather workers, and makers of lamps and roof tiles. Indeed, Winkelmann's stress on commonalities across media approaches a kind of zeitgeist. He had already mused in the Gedanken that, quote, arts have their infancy as well as men. Perhaps the primitive Greek painters drew in the same manner that their first good tragedian, Aeschylus, thought in. In the history, he states explicitly that, quote, the indisputable communion between poetry and art and the influence of one on another allows us to see in the invaluable fragments of Menander the beauties of the artistic works in which Apelles and Lysippus clothed the graces. When Winkelmann turns to the surviving visual evidence, I'm sorry, I should have been showing you this all along. When Winkelmann turned to the surviving visual evidence, the changes were just as profound. This comes in the final section of chapter four, ambitiously titled, Painting of the Ancient Greeks. That proves a misnomer, however, since what Winkelmann offers, apart from a few sentences on the ancients' taste for ornamenting walls and a somewhat confused explanation of technique, is not in fact thoughts or even speculations on Greek painting, but a detailed description of those late and inferior Roman period planks whose relation to the mothership is never specifically addressed. Yet there is a notable change in temper with respect to his earlier writings, not least because of the spectacular discoveries in recent years, a thousand wall paintings in Naples alone that allow us to, quote, speak and pass judgment on ancient painting with greater knowledge and learning than previously possible. His chapter surveys the highlights from the familiar paintings unearthed in Rome, such as the Aldobrandini wedding and the so-called Dea Barberini, to exciting new discoveries, most notably the Ganymede, but also the two panels that Winkelmann used to um, uh, preface his chapter, which he knew only in the form of drawings by Casanova. Now, much of his discussion here is purely factual, recounting their discoveries, subsequent intrigues, and their iconography. Yet he rapturizes about the Ganymede, calling it, quote, without doubt, one of the most beautiful figures to survive from antiquity. I can find nothing to compare with his face, he adds. So much sensuality radiates from it that his whole life seems to be nothing but a kiss. <clears throat> I think that quality is admittedly uh, hard to see on the surviving panel. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I show you Heinrich Meyer's uh, copy uh, that he made from memory now in Weimar that I think perhaps comes close to what Winkelmann laid eyes on. I quote this passage not to critique Winkelmann's gullibility, but to underscore his return to an aestheticizing and ekphrastic mode that he otherwise reserves for sculpture. Much the same favorable tone marks his comments on the paintings from the buried cities, which he saw in four trips to Naples in 1758, 1762, 1764, and 1765. And to stress, he largely encountered these as extracted and framed and glazed in the museum in Portici. 
Returning to his Dresden mode, he still finds fault with specific painterly passages, wishing that the painter of the large Theseus had been truer to the text and painted a more androgynous hero with flowing hair, which is actually how he'd in, uh, first encountered it in Belicar's uh, drawing. Finkelmann also dislikes the portrayal of Hercules in The Birth of Telephus and finds the remaining faces common. He's happier with the Chiron and Achilles, praising a youth whose forehead, quote, betrays a noble shame and self-reproach for his lack of skill as his teacher takes the plectrum and seeks to correct him where he went wrong. It is beauty in Aristotle's sense. The sweetness and charm of youth are joined with pride and sensitivity. And just to note, he critiques then the plate of the Antiquita di Ercolano, which actually shows Achilles staring past his teacher rather than at him. Finkelmann reserves his longest and fullest iconographic descriptions for four enigmatic paintings from Stabiae that he first assumed were Greek imports based on their quality uh, and their discovery as detached panels, although he later revised this view in his next trip upon learning about the earthquake that had preceded the eruption, and he reinterpreted these panels as local products in his 1764 report on the discoveries at Herculaneum. This is not to claim that Winkelmann approves of all the ancient paintings he saw, but gone are the blanket condemnations of faulty contour and expression that pervaded the uh, Gedanken. Tellingly, Winkelmann re reserves his highest praise for pictures we might consider purely decorative, such as the famous dancers Bacchants and especially the centaurs from Pompeii, all contorting actively on black backgrounds and decidedly not at rest. Perhaps to his surprise, Winkelmann found these floating figures the most beautiful in Portici, per the 1762 Zenschreiben. He found them, quote, the work of a great master. They are as fleeting as a thought and as beautiful as if they were drawn by the graces. He uses similar terms in the Geschichte, recognizing, quote, the hand of a learned and confident artist, done with great facility, as if with a single brushstroke. So much for simple contour. In the letter, but not the history, his next favorite paintings are a pair of humorously enamored satyrs, the first attempting to kiss a girl, the second a hermaphrodite, again, the opposite of elevated subject matter or heroic bodies at rest. Yet Finkelmann is seduced, quote, nothing more voluptuous can be imagined and nothing could be painted more beautifully. He even, Pace Vitruvius, whose denunciation of illogical architecture he duly echoes in the Geschichte, allows himself in the 1764 report to praise the creativity, eloquence, and execution of, Pompe of Pompeian Groteschi as, quote, the most perfect I have seen, not only ancient, but also modern, including the most beautiful in the loggias of Raphael. They are true miniature paintings. The leaves on the trees are rendered with the finest veins, and the color looks if it, as if it had just been painted. The villa is not identified, but perhaps it resembled this plate from the Antiquita di Ercolano. Compare these eruptions of admiration, we might call them, to one British observer's dismissal of the Vesuvian paintings as miserable daubings in 1751, or Cochin's characterization of them as unfinished. And perhaps most interestingly of all, Winkelmann was, at least in 1764, indifferent to the one group of paintings whose clear outlines, statuesque poses, and Greek inscriptions he should theoretically have admired. Captivated by the grotesques, he found even these Greek products common and mediocre. What I'm proposing is that Winkelmann's belated encounter with the late and derivative provincial wall decoration upset some of his preconceived ideas, even as it thrust him back after a period of text-based theorizing into his old connoisseurial mode. One wonders how his thoughts on painting might have evolved had he returned safe from Trieste. My own rereading of the Geschichte and the Herculaneum letters suggests that doubts had begun to gnaw on aspects of his doctrine, due in part to new evidence and in part to an awareness that the best Greek art might never be recovered. Even the Imperial Romans, he admits, made excellent paintings. In the meantime, one must look and look again as Winkelmann advised pilgrims to Portici. The traveler who sees these treasures for the first time, he wrote in the 1764 Zentschreiben, repeating his visit to the museum as often as he can, should here, as after every reflection upon antiquities and works of art, remind himself of the Pythagorean verse with which those philosophers interrogated themselves every evening. Where have I failed? What have I done? Which duty have I escaped? This colloquium asks us the same questions. Thank you. Merci beaucoup sorry, pour sorry. cette autre très très belle communication qui pour une fois fait le point réel.
et concret sur les liens entre Winkelmann et la peinture. Des questions, des considérations, des réactions avant d'aller déjeuner Oui. Euh, Claudia Yes, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, I would like to just like hear your thoughts about um, the relation he establishes between color and allegory. Um, and I have the impression that this somehow kind of authorizes him also to talk about color in sculpture and how much of this um, connection between color and allegory, um, I mean, helps him to revalue color and painting in, I mean, in his whole work? You know, it's a great question, but I have to confess that I don't remember him mentioning color in his discussion of allegory. Perhaps you do better than I. Um, now, in the Fezu, he has a whole chapter uh -huh. on, on color allegorical and, color, color right. as allegory. I'll, I'll have to look back so, at that. Yeah. In, I, I was focusing mostly on his early, you know, uh -huh. yeah. expression of this. And then in, you don't find anything like that before. Yeah, and I think, you know, yeah. I think at the earlier moment, he would put uh -huh. color into the same realm as fine execution, which uh -huh. is, it's important, but if, if that's the focus of one's attention, you've missed the point, because the point is the idea behind, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It's, it's something I'll have to think more about. Yeah. No, maybe it's, I mean, I think one interesting thing that you show is kind of how he sort of changes his way of seeing painting um, I mean, after I, this more intense experience and in, like in contact with um, Ecolanum. And so maybe this, uh, I mean, his rereading of, of color and his late work maybe is associated to this change. Well, I, I was very struck by, you know, Cecile's connection, and she obviously showed the same um, uh, painting on, on marble, and I, I hadn't thought that perhaps one, re I've been puzzled by why he didn't respond to it, you know, in any kind of way, and perhaps it relates to this idea that he's, he's sorted it somehow into the realm of drawing, and it, 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 in, it in some way can't compete with the fresh colors that he's seeing and reacting to, in a way despite himself. Yeah. I mean, one of the questions I'd like to think more about is whether there's a difference between the things he allows himself to say in the letters and then the things he sort of feels obliged to say in the Geschichte. They're really at the same moment and they intertwine, but as you point out, there are different audiences and he permits, he permits himself a different type of appreciation. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, every time. Which, which to me really reinforces this colloquium's you know, beneficial call to, to look back at the text as individual texts and think about questions of audience and genre and to deconstruct this idea of Winkelmann as a monolith to be understood from the Gedanken in, in particular, yeah. Pablo? is revealing the flows and the mechanical system of thinking of Winkelmann. It looks, it, it seems to me when he's looking to the paintings and especially to another object that I think we were not talking today, but was one of the other objects that was very, that makes the reputation of Herculaneum, the, the um, uh, now it's not coming to my mind, but the, mos the mosaics, why he is not using those in more in, in, in his, in his big narrative of the history of art is not because, from my point of view, what I think in Wilkeman is that he has an ideal and whatever is not going inside this model, he tends to, he can admire, he can use, but he's always putting it in the shores, in the different sides, not in order to conflict with his, uh, his big narrative. Showing the epistemological foundations of Winkelmann 
uh, history of art. I mean, I think this came out in Cecile's uh, contribution as well, uh, the extent to which even deep admiration compels him to keep certain things at the margins. And what puzzles me about the mosaics, which he does describe in you know, eloquent and very approving terms, is that he, he, he doesn't seem to use them as we would use them today as a window onto Greek painting. I mean, the, the thing that I find lacking in all of his discussion, his meticulous, I mean, in some ways, his descriptions of these, these paintings from from Herculaneum and even these new fakes that were discovered in Rome, they're among the most detailed iconographic descriptions. He's aware that people don't have them in front of, of their eyes, but he's, he's, he's fascinated by the iconography and he does not go beyond to say, but what might this tell us about Greek art of, of a better period? He, he says vaguely, they might be by Greek artists. He, he suspects they are. That's, in a way, the least interesting thing you'd expect him to say. And the mosaics are prime evidence that he simply does not use. Encore des questions? Ou bien, oui, une dernière. Lorette. Peut-être le micro, parce qu'ici, on n'entend pas très bien. It's coming. La salle est grande. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of, of your relation um, François Dujon, uh, Franciscus Junius, the Pictura Veterum. This is a very important source for Winckelmann still in Rome. When we have the Florentine manuscript, we find a great number of extracts from, from Dujon. And so read these I didn't know before coming here, I'm going to go and study them. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what is striking for me and Dujon when, so, at, uh, the idea of painting of pictura and that kind of literature because pictura is there metonymically art and that's why so that's because um, until the late 18th century uh, painting as a history and a theory uh, otherwise sculpture as a history still before Winckelmann versus Pliny but it's not there's no theory of, of sculpture and when in before going to Rome, Rome uh, Winckelmann simply, like Dujon, apply the categories of the theory of painting to sculpture. So my question is, do you think that when it comes to Rome, when it's near Rome, it reached this theoretical idea of a distinction between painting and sculpture? Because yes, he, he wrote and he perhaps he founded the history of sculpture in a systematical way, but did he because for me, coming perhaps from the aesthetics, and for me, so if I think of the theory of sculpture, I, I think of Herder, not a Winckelmann, for example. Uh, so that the question is, if you think it, if it, it reached this theoretical distinction. It, I would ask you to put it back to you. Doesn't it come again to the question of materiality that in, 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 in Dresden, he's, he's seeing things all in translated materials. There, there's a sort of, um, I mean, the casts that you showed of the gems. It, 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 we always have to think about this process of translation and what, what, do you, what do you focus on but the image, the, you know, the, the extract. And of course in Rome he can't do that. And even if he makes gestures towards addressing artistic technique with a nonsensical water box, you know, in the Geschichte he struggles with technique. I mean, he gets it wrong in the case of painting. but. He's trying to think about how these things were made, and this, you know, as vases. I mean, what does the what does a terracotta technique require an artist to do? What skills do you have to have? So I think it's it's that's part of the story that, as he sees the objects and thinks about their materiality and their production in real terms, as as in a sense a connoisseur, in a place where these things are being collected, you know, and he's presumably advising on this, he's forced to think differently, and he's forced to separate media in a ways that he didn't before. And that's why I find the, the Geschichte so interesting. And I, I think, you know, we say, yes, it was written in 1764. Well, no, I mean, it, it, it itself is a palimpsest of different moments of Winkelmann's, yeah, you know, thought. And I sense a difference. And it would be very interesting, I think, maybe someone has done it, to look at the Geschichte almost as you'd look at the Gospels or something and try to pick out which are the parts that were written when and how does that explain the very bizarre structure? Yeah, why, why does his chapter on Greek painting have nothing to do with Greek painting yeah. 
when actually he should have put other things in. And I think it's because he'd already written those parts. And that's at the level at which he's comparing media. And then later, I th I'm sure that that section is the last thing he wrote. He deals with the specificity of media in a very different, very different voice, and he almost doesn't know what to say about it, which I find very interesting. Merci beaucoup pour cette très belle matinée. Et nous sommes censés, Cécile, être ici à deux heures et quart.